Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for journey mercies. We thank you for your protection of our leaders, state overseers, pastors, and all the workers that have come. We pray that as you have protected us and you have brought us here, that this workers' retreat will be a time of the outpouring of the blessings of God in Jesus' name. We pray that as we have come here, you will touch every life. And you will recreate within us a spirit that will seek after you in Jesus' name. We pray that all lukewarmness will get away from our lives. All laziness in prayer will get away from our lives. That as we hear the word of God, the challenges we're going to receive, the word we're going to hear, will do work great in our hearts in Jesus' name. We pray that you make us attentive to the word we're going to hear. And that these words will so touch us will never be the same again in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. As we start the workers' retreat, I begin with the message, Our Fallow Ground. Our Fallow Ground. Osea chapter 10, verse 12. Sow to yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Here the prophet of God, Osea by name, was sent to the people of Israel, the people of God. And he told them, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. Then Osea, this prophet of God, told the children of Israel, he said, it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Osea the prophet had become concerned since the Lord appointed him as a prophet over the nation of Israel. There are a lot of reasons why he became concerned. One, Israel was forgetting their spiritual roots. As I just told you now, you see, Israel had been a people that had been called of God. And God had given them the law of his own kingdom. And that law had no equal in any other place. But Israel at this time was forgetting the law of their God. Not only that, the Lord had appointed a way of worship, pure worship. Totally different from the way of worship of the heathens, of the pagans. Again, Israel was forgetting that. The Lord had told the children of Israel how they will seek his blessing. Again, they were forgetting the way of getting the blessings of God. They had been a righteous and a holy nation. But the righteousness of God had been forgotten in Israel. And so when God called Osea and he sent him to the people of Israel, he told him, tell the people, they were forgetting their spiritual roots. They had backslidden. They had gone away from him. Now they must do something. One, in God sending Osea to the people of God, even though they were backslidden, it means that God had not totally forsaken them. Yes, they were separated from God, but he still wanted them. That is why he was showing them the way back so fellowship with God, it may so happen that you as an individual, or maybe your whole family, or maybe your own community, or maybe all the workers in your own local church, they have left the spiritual roots, and they are forsaking the Lord. And yet, our coming together here, and the Lord still wanting to speak to us, shows that he has not forsaken us. He has not forgotten us. He knows that a change is still possible. That is why he is sending these messages for the hearing unto us. So the prophet came to them 
and he spoke in a language they could understand. Break up your fallow ground. We have a great privilege here to break up our fallow ground and to begin to sow in righteousness. Here is preparation for the greatest experience of life. And I'm believing that every one of us will get into the secret chamber of God where he will remake us and remold us into vessels of honor. I believe that this retreat you have come could be one of the moments of life different from all other moments in your life. As you will allow God to impart his image to you so that he will make you new creatures. It is a time we cannot play with, a time we cannot trifle with, a time we cannot waste. And people often tell us that the morning shows the day. What they mean by that is that the beginning often determines the end. And the way we apply that in our retreat here is that this first message or your first contact or your first response can determine the amount of God's supply to your spiritual life. If you take this opening time, this opening session, and this first message serious, and you really break up your fallow ground and you call upon the Lord, then the rest of the time will be a wonderful time for you. Do not waste any time. Let us decide and let us determine the purpose of God for bringing us here. And let that purpose be fulfilled. What did this prophet mean by the fallow ground? Because if you do not know what the fallow ground is all about, you will not know what it means to break it up. The prophet told them, break up your fallow ground. Not another person's fallow ground, your own fallow ground. The children of Israel were farmers in the majority. Many of them were shepherds. And so God was talking to them in a language they could understand. Fallow ground is land left untilled. Land left unsown for some time. Having had crust on the surface that needs to be broken up before you can sow the seed. It's like when a farmer has plowed the field. But then after he has plowed the field, he did not sow immediately. And rain begins to fall on that empty land. And the sun shines on that empty land. What the rain and the sun do to such land is that it will harden the surface of that ground. And then the wind will blow to evaporate the moisture out of the plowed ground. Not only that, weeds will begin to grow, taking up the nutrients in the ground. And then as the wind blows, chaff and debris will cover the face of the fallow ground. What we call debris is rubbish. Mass of rocky fragments will be dumped on the ground by scavengers. So the children of Israel had become like fallow ground. Rain had fallen, but it didn't plant anything. The sun had shone upon them. It only hardened them. The wind had been blowing. It only evaporated the moisture of grace and goodness in them. Their holiness or their goodness, like the morning dew, had dried up. Weeds had grown in their lives. And these weeds had taken up the moisture of goodness or kindness or love or obedience in their lives. Debris or rubbish or the mass of rocky fragments had been dumped by scavengers. Scavengers are those who pick up the dirty, dirty things and dump it on a land that is not being used. You've seen that around your communities where you live. A man has land, but he doesn't put any building on. All the neighbors around will be bringing all the dirty things in their houses, dumping on that ground. That is what happened to Israel. The surrounding nations dumped all the debris and rubbish of their idolatry upon Israel. So God likened their hearts to fallow ground that now needs to be broken up, plowed again, before they could sow anything. It says in Jeremiah chapter 4, Jeremiah 
chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise your heart, yourselves to the Lord, and take away the false skin of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. These two verses clear up what I've been explaining to you, that their hearts have become hardened, and that weeds had grown on their hearts. They had become like land grown up with thorns. And so Jeremiah told them, do not sow the good seed that God is giving you now on the thorns. Amidst the thorns, you must break up the fallow ground. You must root out the weeds and the thorns before you begin to sow. And then you must circumcise yourself and take away the hard crust on the surface of your heart. I told you that these people had become hardened. Because of that, they were likened to fallow ground. In other passages of the Bible, we find evidences and reasons why they were called fallow ground. And why many of us will also be referred to by the Lord himself as fallow ground. But then that fallow ground does not mean that you cannot do anything good again. But it only means that before anything good can be done, you must break up, break up the fallow ground. First Samuel chapter 6. First Samuel chapter 6, verse 6. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go, and they departed? Now you see over here, we are being told, we are being reminded of the history of Egyptians and Pharaoh. They saw many miracles. They saw the power of God. Yet Pharaoh had been hardened. He said, who is that God that I will let the children of Israel go? He had fallow ground. Even though he saw the rain of miracle coming upon the land. Even though he saw the wind of the power of God blowing. Even though he saw the thunders of the judgment of God upon the nation. A few times they will tremble. A few times they will be afraid. But later I will change his mind again. That's the fallow ground. You see many of us, there, there's no doubt we have been hearing the messages of the word of God in our churches. And you will not say you have not heard about repentance, about restitution, about real genuine salvation. You will not say you have not heard about freedom from sin. Sometimes when you hear the thunder of the word of God, you tremble. But like Pharaoh, you change your mind the following day. You do not fully repent. And your heart is hardened. And these Philistines were asking, why should they harden their hearts? Did not Egypt and Pharaoh, did they not yield eventually to let the people go? Did they not eventually break up their fallow ground? Did not even the magicians surrender and say, why should we continue like this? Because the miracles that Moses is uh, making to come on the land will destroy the land entirely. And so these Philistines were saying, let us not harden ourselves anymore. That's what the Lord is saying to you tonight. You have hardened your heart. You have been like the fallow ground. That even now, even though you call yourself a worker, you might be sleeping in church while your pastor is preaching. Even though you call yourself a worker in the church, you may find out that even when the word of God is spoken, that should drive you to repentance and to renounce all your sin, yet it appears it has not moved you. That's fallow ground. When you see that the word of God is preached and it doesn't make a permanent change in your life, it doesn't go deep, deep into your heart. And you hear, you just pull back your shoulders and you just go the same way again. You pray, but you cannot pray with conviction and you cannot really pray with a deep change of heart. That's fallow ground. And as we come here to bring the fallow ground before the Lord, we need to break it up. The fallow ground. It will be of no use to be planting if you are not going to break up the fallow ground. 
Because the heart is hardened already. Hardened already. And because it is hardened, it must be broken up before we can begin to sow. And I believe that God really wants to sow something into our hearts. For this workers' retreat, he wants to bless us in a mighty way. He wants to uh, renew our spiritual lives, but he cannot begin to do it if you do not break up the fallow ground. God is wise. He will not give the holy thing to dogs, neither will he cast his peers before swine. He's not going to cast a seed on fallow ground. Before you can cast a seed upon your heart, you must be willing to break up your hardened fallow ground. In 2 Kings chapter 17, from verse 14, notwithstanding, they will not hear, but hardened their necks, like the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God, they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them and they followed vanity and became vain. This is talking about us. We profess we are saved. We profess we are children of God. We profess we belong to a church called Deeper, Deeper Life. We profess that we are even workers in such a church, and yet we harden our hearts. Many of us will hear of the doctrine and the teaching of the Bible concerning restitution, and yet we harden our hearts, and we do not go in the way of the Lord. It says they followed vanity and became vain. Many of us have followed the vanity of the people of the world. The vanity in their marriage, the vanity of worldliness, the vanity of the amassing of the wealth of this world, the vanity of chasing after the shadow and chasing after the mirages of life. And we have become vain in our personalities, in our Christian lives. We do not have the power and the authority that the early believers had, not even the conviction. That the early believers had, we have followed vanity, we have become vain. Until there is no difference now between a so called worker, between you and the members of the church. There is no clear court demarcation, a higher standard, a higher way of living, a deep spiritual life, quality spiritual life of fellowship with the Lord. We have all become vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. It's now unfortunate that many of our churches, branches, and many of our members and workers we do like the people of the world. We dress like the people of the world. You find all these um, women that put on the topless. You can almost see uh, their chest outside they call themselves christians they might even say they are workers we have become vain just like the people of the world and you will find now people that call themselves workers they come to church whether sunday or whenever they come to the church in the states they wear their caps like the men or they might wear their flowing uh, garment like the men and it is just the same thing that the men are wearing, that the women are wearing. When you see this, uh, somebody that just started coming to the church for the first week, you say, well, they don't know. But when you see it in people that have been coming to the church for one year, and they say that they lead us fellowship, they say they are workers, and they follow the customs of the people around them, of whom the Lord has straightly commanded and charged, we should not be like the people of the world. We have been hardened. And it is not that our preachers don't tell us. It is not that they are faithful, they are, they are unfaithful in telling us this is the word of God. Well, our attitude is, but they do it in that other church. They do it in that other church. They do it in that other church. But you are not in the other church. If you wanted to do like them, why didn't you stay in those other churches? Why did you leave where you were? 
Why did you come to a church like this? Didn't you know it was a different church before you came? And you see people have become vain. And there are people that are telling us that now they don't see anything wrong in television. They have become vain like the people of the world. They tell us that they cannot do without all the sports in the, on the television. They cannot do without all the entertainment on the television. That it makes them happy. That the happiness that Jesus gives is not sufficient. If the television does not add to their joy, they will be miserable. They say that salvation is no more enough. They tell us the joy of the Lord is no more enough. They tell us that Christ living in the heart of man is no more enough. You must add the entertainment of the world to make the Christian happy. The Christian is not happy with the, with the presence of Christ in the heart. The Christian is not happy enough now with the presence of the Holy Ghost in the heart. The Christian, the Christian is no more happy now in the place of prayer. We need entertainment. We need the film show. We need the television of the world to make the Christian happy. That means we have gone away. We have gone down the drain. It means that our hearts have been hardened. And it means that we have the fallow ground. And why we have come here is that God will allow us and enable us to break up the fallow ground. So that God can sow the seed of the word of God in our hearts again. Listen to me, friends. You see, as long as your heart is hardened, God cannot sow anything there. The Spirit of God will not take the word you are hearing and then sow anything deep inside there because you are the fallow ground. You have become vain. You see, in our marriages now, we have followed the people of the world. We have become vain. We bring all these people together and we distribute our cards. We even they distribute the cards now beyond Nigeria. They want all the world to know they are getting married. They won't spend one hour praying for that marriage. They won't spend time to go and seek the face of the Lord and say, Lord, this marriage I am getting into tomorrow, this marriage I'm getting into next month, they won't spend time in prayer. All they're doing now, they're going all about and they're writing to all the states in Nigeria, all the local government states, uh, go local government area in their state, come, I'm going to get married. They go to the bank, they borrow money, they borrow money from this brother, from that brother, from that sister. Even the money of uh, the zone of the church that was kept in their hand. Maybe they are transportation officers or zona leader and uh, the money had been taken together in the zone. Take care of the people in the zone with this. They will say, I will borrow the money from, from my marriage. When I finish uh, the marriage, I will pay it back again. How are you different from the people of the world? You cannot cut your coat now according to your size. We are running after the people of the world. And when people come together now, all they are looking for, ah, this is your new dress, sister. Where did you get this? Every time you come out, new, new, new every time. Where did you get this? Who is the tailor that is helping you sew your dress? And the last time we came for workers' retreat, on Wednesday you came in one colorful dress. When I saw you on Thursday, everything, you have changed again. On Friday, you have changed again. On Saturday, where do you get all this? That's what deeper life is running after now. Our hearts are hardened. We're just like all the other churches now. You see, when you pour water on hard ground, it doesn't sink in there. When you throw seed on hard ground, it doesn't sink in there. All that we hear does not sink anymore in our hearts. Because we have become fallow ground. You know, fallow ground actually is backsliding heart. That it will not take, it will not receive the word of God. All the time, we're busy comparing ourselves with ourselves. Now, people, can, they cannot dress as I'm dressing now because, you see, it doesn't show that they are general overseer. They're general superintendent. It is the cap we wear or the coat we put on or the type of special dress we wear that now marks us out as either general overseer or marks us out as pastor no more the spirit of god no more the quietness no more the deep peace of god in the heart no more the gentleness in the life of the people it is not what they put on that marks them out as who they are it is not what is within but you see in the beginning when we started it wasn't that that marked us out it was our difference from the people of the world that marked us out as 
deeper life, brethren and believers. But now, I know you hear that in your church, but you say, well, we don't know what happened to a pastor today that he just woke up and is lashing everybody. He'll get over it in two weeks. And so you don't hear. But if we continue like this, we shall perish. If we continue like that, the whole church will perish. But so that we will not perish, that's why we need to break up our fallow ground. It says in verse 16, they let all the commandments of the Lord their God. Now in marriage, people will go any length, spend any amount of money, unfortunately for them. Because that marriage was not based on prayer, built on prayer. Three weeks after that, three months after that, you have to be settling quarrels for them. Can you imagine people who are workers? Can you imagine people who are preachers? Can you imagine people that married in your own church? Deeper life church. You have to be settling quarrels for them after three weeks and three months of marriage. Now it shows that hearts have become fallow ground. And the reason we have come this time, as I told you, is to di discover our spiritual roots. And then break up the fallow ground. And really pray so that we will not continue like we have been. In Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 3. O Lord, and not thine eyes upon the truth. Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have, not, they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have, they have refused to return. There may be some of you that uh, our pastors and leaders in your state have tried to correct you by saying, well, brother, you will not lead us fellowship for some time. Go and pray on this matter. Or maybe the overseer called you and said, sister, you will not lead us fellowship for some time. Or you will not uh, be in the work for some time. You need to correct this in your life. And how did you react? Just like fallow ground. No change. No soberness. Even in your facial appearance. Oh, you say, I don't fear any man. That's how Israel reacted. They didn't fear any man. When they lost the grace of God. And they became like fallow ground. And you will say, I don't fear any pastor. Overseer or no overseer. I don't fear anybody. And even though they say I should not do the work, then you just say, okay, thank you. I've heard you left the work. But he told you so that you could correct your life. But you will not pray. You'll be gossiping behind him. You'll be saying, well, we, we don't know what they're doing. Don't they have their own faults? Don't they have their own problems? And all the time he's knocking at me here and he's uh, trying to discipline me, saying, I will not lead us fellowship. Let them take their house fellowship. I know what I can do. I'm an evangelist, I'm a soul winner, I can still talk to people outside, our fellowship is nothing to me, and you didn't change. And eventually, he, after a long time, he called you, and uh, maybe your pastor or your state overseer said, uh, Sister, about the thing I told you to pray about. Oh, well, you say I've been praying. The thing I told you to pray about, not general prayer. Everybody prays, pagans pray. Unbelievers pray, murderers pray, robbers on the side of the road, they pray. It's not general prayer we're talking about. How about what you were corrected for? You were told to go and pray. I've been praying. That's not the answer. Have you repented? Have you seen that evil you have been doing? Have you broken up your fallow ground? Have you gone back to God and said, God, I know I am a backslider. Now I am repenting. This sin that the, my pastor is correcting me for, I know I am wrong. I know I have gone astray. That's the prayer we mean. But uh, you say I'm praying, and the pastor tries to explain to you, well, brother, you know I don't hate you. You know I love you. I'm your pastor. I have to take care of you. It's because I want to change your life. Yes, I know, I know, I know. And please pray. And then we'll come back to the, we, we need to do this work. Thank you. Then you go. You will not pray on that thing. You are above that leader. And then when he calls you again, instead of you coming back again after you have prayed, being sober, being so sorry that you have gone wrong, instead of coming back and seeking the favor of your leader, you, you will, you know, stay behind there 
and uh, eventually he's the one that will be concerned and call you again and say ah, ah, brother what's the matter sister what's the matter oh nothing i've been coming to church or did they tell you i wasn't coming to church i've been coming not just coming everybody comes don't you see the many people that come he's talking particularly about you and eventually he says well brother i'm only trying to correct you i hope you have listened you have learned a lesson well i'm always learning lesson will never stop learning lesson all right and just to show that he is more mature than you are he knows that you have not really changed he says well we're not going to kill all this or drive them away all of them okay be doing the work now and you are still the same old fellow and you're on that work you refuse to change all the evil things were corrected for before they were not done don't you see my friend my brother my sister that that is fallow ground are we going to be carrying that hard heart all about you carry it to lagos now are you going to carry it back are you not going to allow the hammer of the word of god the digger of the word of god the shovel of the word of god the plow of the word of god to break up the fallow ground whom are you disrespecting the person your pilot to heaven don't you know without that pastor you cannot make heaven yes you have bible you had bible before you were born again but those were the people that opened the word of god to you that made you to know about repentance don't you know when you first came you knelt down you had it's the same preacher that preached to you and then you wept you cried that's how you got saved without him you wouldn't have got saved now you are equals he can't talk to you it's through that same person when you were, when you said i wanted to be a worker i wanted to be a worker you ran to him straight overseer or pastor i want to be a worker and he said well you must pray he should do the bible you took it seriously you went back you prayed eventually when he saw how you were picking up and now you wanted to serve the lord now you are a worker but now you are equals he can't talk to you anymore he can't correct you anymore if he preaches anything now you have to be looking at everything that grammar is not correct you have mind mouth to correct the grammar of your preacher it's grammar that will take you to heaven now you people when you first came to church you heard about deeper life the devil was chasing you and the witches were chasing you all these uh, evil powers were chasing after you you ran you ran to celestial there was no answer you ran everywhere there was no answer then you heard about deeper the very first day you got into into the church building oh yes the church building maybe there was no good cement on the ground maybe there was no tile maybe there was near no condition maybe there was fan that was blowing dust on everybody you didn't see that when the devil was chasing you and you ran into that building the moment you ran into that dirty place the place that you now say is dirty the place that is not good now the place now where you say what are they doing there but remember the first day you ran there you had the peace of god were you not the fellow that came out to give testimony and you said i didn't know a church like this is here before and now when the choir sang they were like angels when the brother leading the prayer came out and was leading prayer you said ah, are these people where have they been and i didn't know and when the preacher came out and he said praise the lord the tone of the voice and every, and he read the word of god you were crying like a baby you said i never had anybody preach like this before but now it's still that same preacher but it has nothing on you anymore now that's fallow ground the thing that touched you before the thing the thing that affected you before the thing that made you to you nailed down you said lord this deeper life i will die here and after they finished the meeting you were still crying and praying they came to say the meeting is ended you say no i can't go home we had somebody here that uh, you know he came to she came to church when she had the word of god that's the first time she came and uh, she prayed and she really got an experience from the lord then uh, the people said the meeting has me oh she said i'm not going home that this is where i'm going to be living they say no they don't live here they only come to pray here and hear the word of god here he said the peace of god i feel now if i go outside this building will i still get it it's just building like this not even as good as this at that time it's not the building it's the power of god but maybe you felt like that before when you first came but now everything looks normal everything what are they doing there you hear the word of god even while the preacher is opening the bible calling the passage you know that passage already isn't that fallow ground brethren 
Have we not gone astray? Have we not gone away from the Lord? That the preacher, your preacher, sometimes they get so burdened, they come to the pulpit, he prays, and then after the prayer, he begins to preach, and then he may come to a stage, he begins to cry. You just sit down like this and be looking at him and say, oh, what's, what's the matter with this man? When is he going to finish this message? What's he crying about? And then after he has finished crying, I say, well, rise up and pray. You sit down there, you are looking at him. Eventually, you know, other people pray. You pity the other people that are praying. What have they had their praying about? What is so serious in what this man has said? Is, didn't he just quote that passage that we knew long, long ago? You are fallow ground. That man is almost dying on the pulpit to give you the word of God and it will not change you. What do you want again? You want somebody to come from heaven? Like the rich man said, Lazarus should go and tell his five brethren here. But if you hear not Moses and the prophets, you can never be saved. You'll never get to heaven. These are the only preachers you have. And you know that they have no equal. There's no other people that will teach you in this country what these preachers are teaching you. So if you are going to get to heaven, you have to take the message from them. And so we must break up our fallow ground. The thing that has made us nonchalant against the word of God. And it says over here in Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 3, it said they were corrected, but they, will e they even refused correction. How long have you uh, seen some of uh, you know, our preachers, they will call uh, the people... They're trying to be nice to you so that they don't, uh, you know, get too hard on you. And uh, you're still wearing your jewelry. Maybe when you are going to the office. And then the overseer or the pastor might call you and uh, say, uh, Well, uh, sister, since you started coming to the church, what have you learned? He's just going around about. He didn't want to be direct so as not to shock you. You know what he means. And then he says, uh, Well, what changes have taken place in your life? Then you tell stories. Stories that don't impress heaven at all. And then eventually it says, hi about, you know, this. Have you been hearing about this dressing? Oh, yes, I know about it. But as I'm dressing now, that's how the Spirit of God has uh, directed me. You talk in a way as if, uh, you know, you don't want anybody to get into that area. You are the master of your soul, the captain of your faith. Therefore, nobody should poke nose into that area. And when the fellow sees that you are still an Egyptian, living in the midst of Israelites, he doesn't want to bother you, he leaves you alone. You think you have won argument, you have lost your soul. You have lost the grace of God. When you win an argument like that, somebody is trying to counsel you, is trying to lead you, is trying to bring reality into your life, and then you begin to argue and you put your face as somebody that doesn't want correction at all, you are lost. And as we have come here this uh, weekend, you see, it is so that we can break up our fallow ground. And as we break up our fallow ground, we will pray. And as we pray, I believe that the Lord will make changes in our lives in Jesus' name. In Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7. Verse 12. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. It's not God who made your heart hard, it's you. They made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. So all these things that we have done, that makes us like the fallow ground. We must break up the fallow ground. Let's come back to Hosea chapter 10. You've seen examples and illustrations of the fallow ground. The hardened heart. And the heart that has not been yielding to the word of God. The heart that is not soft. The heart that is not yielding anymore. The heart that is rebellious against the word and the doctrines of the Bible. And then you see what the Lord wants us to do. This brings me to the second point. Break up that ground. Dig deep that ground. Uncover the surface of that ground. Clear off the chaff, the debris, and all that the scavengers have dumped upon you. Break it up. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. 
Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 3. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, sow not among thorns. To break up the fallow ground means that you will get rid of the thorns, of the weeds, of the hardness on the surface of the ground. What does that mean in practical terms? Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. From verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. The wayside, is, the wayside ground is a hardened ground. And it is likened to the fellow that hears the word of God and he does not understand. Are you a worker? And then you find that when you are having your quiet time, you are reading one line two times. Why are you doing that? Because your mind is wandering. What is your mind wandering on? Your mind is wandering on when will I get married. Your mind is wandering on how will I get promotion. Your mind is wandering on how will I get my healing. Your mind is wandering on how will I claim my prosperity. The thing that makes your mind to wander is what hinders you from understanding the word of God you are reading. And that is a thing that shows that you are the wayside ground. What then should you do? Those things that your mind is wandering to. Those things that your mind will be going to every time you are praying, every time you are reading the word of God, and therefore you cannot concentrate. You should dig them out, throw them up. Because that is the thing that is covering the surface of your heart that makes your heart hardened ground. When you come to church on Sunday or come to church on a Bible study day and you are hearing the word of God, have you noticed? Do you do not concentrate at the Bible study as at the time of revival hour? If you find in yourself as a worker that you attend more revival hour in a year than you attend Bible study, you are follow ground. There is something that your heart is looking for that you think you cannot get at the study of the Bible. All you are looking for is that you are laboring after the things of this world that will perish. You want healing. You want job. You want marriage. And that is the thing that your mind will be wandering to every time. You see, that shows you that it is that thing that your heart is wandering to that is making you to be absent-minded. Or you find that all that you are thinking about now, you want to leave Nigeria. You want to travel outside the country. You want to go to America. You want to go to Britain. You want to go to Asia. You want to go and study overseas. You are looking for forms. You are looking for this. You are looking for this. You want uh, to present something to the embassy. How will they allow you to do this? That even when you are hearing the word of God, that's where your mind is wandering every time. That's what makes your heart hardened and fallow ground. Because Christ is not the lover of your soul now that is better than thousand lovers. Christ is not the one that has the center of your affection now. You have not centered your affection on things above. Or it may be that anytime you see somebody now that is preaching in your church, in your brand church, you'll be wondering, why didn't they make me a preacher like that? What is this man saying that I cannot preach? What is he doing that I cannot do? And every time you see that, your mind is wandering to, I would have wanted to do that. I should have been given opportunity to do that. And it is that that is making your mind to wander. Then you will know that that is what you are to break up, root out in your life. It says in verse 20, But he that receives seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet as he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by, he is offended. Do you find out as a worker that when you heard the word originally, you were so happy? And you started evangelizing, distributing tracts, telling everybody they must come to this church. 
you've never found a church like this before it is it is so good and wonderful but eventually you saw that well even though you've been telling other people about uh, coming to the church you have not got a child and eventually you begin to consider not getting a child to the point that you say people even make fun of me because I've not got a child how can I still be telling people of Christ well that means that you are just like these people they heard the word of God when tribulation persecution problem arises then you are offended by and by. Or it may be that you are in the church. And pastors and preachers have been told that they should make illustration. Because if they do not illustrate their messages, their messages will not be rich. And the pastor can only illustrate his message from his experiences. His experiences are made up of the counseling that he does. Of what he knows and sees. You cannot make illustration of what you have never seen, of what you have never known, of what you have never seen. Well, part of what he has seen is your own life because he counsels you. And part of what he knows is your life because you live in his church. You come to his church. And he must make illustration. And his illustration, they are calculated to make a change in the lives of people. That's what Jesus did. Jesus made illustrations. He heard of the a tower that fell on people and he made illustration from that he knew that farmers were all around Galilee he made illustration with that he knew that these people he was calling that were close to him they had been fishermen before he made illustration with that he knew about mothers-in-law because Peter had a mother-in-law therefore he made illustrations uh, concerning marriage he knew about children that were brought to him and disciples said you must not uh, you know bring children to him you are disturbing Jesus and he gave illustration about people children piping and telling the other students it's what you know you'll make illustrations with and your preacher was preaching and he made illustration and the illustration happened to be what he knew about you there's no crime in that that's legitimate that's right because he can only make illustrations from the experiences he has then you don't hear the word of God anymore you lose interest you see he is using me to preach aren't you happy somebody can use you to preach to bring conviction on other people to lead other people to repent to challenge other people if some if an example from your life uh, we use uh, we use David's adultery he was a king we use uh, Peter's backsliding and lying that he didn't know Jesus Christ are you greater than David are you greater than Peter we use G Judas Iscariot who came to, with the Lord before and then later went away and somebody came to our church before and now he has absconded he has run away and we use that as illustration why are we offended when the Bible gives us ample provision of all these illustrations and therefore the man cannot hear Bible anymore from that preacher he says it's using me for illustration is an example of a hardened heart a fallow ground now and because of that you will not concentrate on the preaching of the Word of God you become offended and you don't bear fruit anymore and maybe you go behind and then you begin to gossip against the church and against the word of god root out all those things you see the reason we are here this period is that all these things that have come back into our lives we will dig them out we will root them out we will throw them away and they will not be in our lives again in jesus name you see if we workers are like this what are the members like if we get angry at the preachers what will the members do if we will not pay attention to the word of God anymore because somebody made illustration, what will the members do? If we get offended and we say, because I've not got a child, I've not got a job, I've not got this, I've not got that, because of that I cannot evangelize, I cannot stand on the word of God, I've become offended because of persecution, what will the new converts do? That's why we should break up our fallow ground. In verse 22, he also that received the seed among thorns, do not sow among the thorns, here are the thorns we should get rid of. Is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. You see the thorns in our lives, the care of this world. Caring for the things that are of the world. I've spoken about dressing. I've spoken about the outlook of people. 
the cares of this life. They are the sons, and you must root them out. The deceitfulness of riches. Many of our people are forgetting that Jesus said that it will be hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. Very, very hard. Very, very hard. I remember when Jesus said that. He was talking about a rich man who was morally sound. He wasn't talking about a rich man that got the money in an illegitimate way. The man came to him and said, Good master, what shall I do? What good thing will I do to get into the kingdom of God, to have eternal life? And Jesus said, You know the law. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not bear false witness. Do not steal. And, do, and honor your father and your mother. And he said, These things have I done. From my youth, what lack I yet? The man did not get his money by stealing. He didn't get his money by dubious means. And then Jesus said, that money has become idol for you. Throw it away. Throw away your idol. Squander it. Give it to the poor. Then come after you have gotten rid of the idol and come back and follow me. And the man, even though the money was legitimate, but it became an idol, he couldn't follow. It was after that that Jesus said, it will be hard, very hard, for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. And when the disciples were surprised, they said, It is even easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye. Look at that. You, lo you know a camel. You know a needle. It is easier for the camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. What he meant is that in Jerusalem, there was a small gate. If a camel was to enter when the major, the main gate had been closed, you will offload the load at the back of that camel. The camel will go down and crawl inside. That's the only way a rich man can get into the kingdom of God. He must offload. All the desire for more money, all the desire for riches in the world, all the desire for property, he must offload all that and then bow down and crawl. And then get into the kingdom of God. How many of the rich men we have today, even those who may be here tonight, are willing to offload? Some people have second wife. They don't tell the church. They're living away the first wife. They are not willing to offload that second wife and crawl and get into the kingdom of God. We can be called workers. We can be members of any church. And yet you are not offloading like that camel. And you depend on your riches. You think, well, the church cannot do without me. Well, maybe the visible church, the church organization, cannot do without you. But Christ will do without you. He did without that man, the man that came, and he told him there's a way to the kingdom of God. Get rid of those riches, get rid of the idol, and crawl in and get into the kingdom of God. And he was full and he went back. Jesus did without him. He never got into the kingdom of God. The visible church or the local phys physical administration, organization, may say they cannot do without you. But the kingdom of God will do without you. If you do not offload all the cares of the world, all the riches of this world, all the things you are running after, when money comes to your mind to the point that you cannot have quiet time, you are in a hurry. You say, I have appointment. Isn't that an insult to God? You cannot pray for 10 minutes, 30 minutes. You cannot kneel down and pray and say, God, bye-bye. I'm sorry, I have an appointment. What appointment? In Christianity, that a man cannot sit down and read the Bible in the morning. For 30 minutes, he has appointment with men that will perish. He cannot pray. Other people will say, well, God, I cannot read too much Bible. You know I am too busy. Isn't that an insult? You're too busy for God. And you are telling God, you know that, Lord, I am not like, you know, all these other Christians. They have all the time on their hand. They don't have anything. But, you know, I am so and so, so and so in the sight of God. What of Pharaoh? What of Nebuchadnezzar? What of Belshazzar? All that they had. When God dealt with them, where were they? So please come down and offload all those things away from your mind. These are the things you are to dig up. These are the things you are to throw out. These are the things that you have to deal with and then you bow down. Do you know that today we find it difficult for people to bow down to the word of God? 
Now, when these, uh, when the poor people come from our villages around here, and we tell them that a child of God doesn't watch television, they bow. Oh, they said they didn't know that before. They go to pray. They say, God, whatever we like, that immoral thing, that terrible show in my heart, pull it out. You call these uh, rich men and tell them, well, the child of God will not suck in all these evil things that are coming on television. Oh, they say, I'm educated. I can't take that. If you can't take that, you can't take the kingdom of God. You know, we tell them all these other poor people that are coming into the church, we tell them that a child of God, a man does not marry two wives. It's one man, one wife. And these people that come among the low class society, they bow down. Oh, they said, oh Lord, this second wife, I love her, but I love you more. I will obey you. With tears, with agony, it's very painful to cut off that right hand. Very, very painful to cut off that second one. But they said, I will do it. They said, our preachers have read the word of God to me. I can read it myself. I know that that is the word of God. They pray. It may take them one day praying. It may take them even fasting. It may take them real prayer and weeping before they can do it. But they do it. But you tell any of these people, they say, well, um, I've come to the church and I want to serve God. Well, you will say you want to serve God, but there's something in your way. That second wife has to go. Oh, they say, uh, well, it depends on your interpretation. The grammar of that thing and the background of it and the context. You have mouth to argue. Argue the word of God. You are going to argue yourself out of the kingdom of God. Your grammar will take you out of the kingdom of God. The people that don't have grammar, the publicans, the tax collectors, and the poor people, they will get in before you. The people that can pray, the people that will say, Oh Lord, it appears difficult, but I know this is your word, and I want to obey your word. Those are the people that get into the kingdom of God, the camels that offload, and are able to crawl, and they enter. Those are the people that get to the kingdom of God. Not the camels that are so big and so high and have a lot of, a lot of women on their back, a lot of uh, you know, color television, black and white television, and pornography and video and a lot of things. They say, oh, if I get rid of all these things, what will I be watching again? You'll be watching Christ. You'll be watching the Bible. You'll, be, you'll just be watching heaven. You'll be raising up your eyes to heaven. And you'll be watching the glory of God. That's enough to watch. But you know, they are not satisfied with that. And if you are not satisfied with that, heaven will be far away from you. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. The deceitfulness of riches. Riches, they deceive people's hearts. And we know some of our people here. Now, listen to me. We are the people that prayed for them. When some of you, when you came to Deeper Life Church, you didn't have a, you didn't have a bicycle. You didn't even have the license to ride motorcycle. But we began to get concerned for you because you've been serving God. And we saw your thirst and your earnestness. And we began, we were the people that prayed and fasted for you. You came for general retreat, workers retreat. We prayed the blessings of God upon you. We said, Lord, look at your people. They're seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And uh, therefore, add all these things to them. And God began to give you a vehicle. You know, before, you were the people that didn't have anything at all. But now you can, you know, go in the airplane if you are coming from the north. And you can ride in your Pijo vehicle. You can ride, uh, you know, your Volkswagen or Volvo. But when you came to church, you had nothing. And when you had nothing, we could call you and talk to you. We could talk to you about restitution then. We could talk to you about marriage then. We could cancel you at that time. But now, after our own prayer for you has been answered, and you have got healed, and you have got car, and you have got all the things of this world, we can't see your face on the ground anymore. We can't talk to you again. While we're talking to you, you'll be dangling the keys of your car. You'll be saying, uh, excuse me, sir. If you can finish in time, I have a place to go. You have a place to go while the pastor is talking to you. Where are you going? You know what's on the road where you are going? Who are the people that prayed that brought that key into your hand? Please, come down and get under that gate as a camel and say, Lord, I still want the kingdom of heaven. Because, you know, if this continues in your life, you'll just be hearing the story of the rapture after we have gone. 
If this continues in your life, the hard ground, the fallow ground, the one that is not humble, that will not take the word of God, all these, uh, you know, types of dressing that will leave, the, will leave your, you know, chest area, you women, all the palming that, you know, you are doing, that you are covering up, all the bleaching that you are doing, that you have gone back to, all the jewelry and the little, little things, and the, you know, golden type of scarf that, you know, you don't really want to use the real thing, but you are using the imitation, so the people of the world will not think you are backward. All those, uh, you know, adaptations, if you are not careful, you will be hearing after we have gone. And you'll be lecturing the people that that is the Antichrist. When you hear him having 666, you'll be saying, oh, be, before uh, Brakumuyi went away, he told us about 666. You'll be saying, before the pastor went away, he told us about 666. That time, who will be comforting you? Because in the market, before you sell, you have to take that number. If you didn't take that number, they will not know big man or big woman. In that place, if you, don't, if you don't take the number, what are you going to do at that time? This is the time to break up your fallow ground. I see you have hard hearts, fallow ground. And it is very difficult now for the word of God to penetrate. But this retreat, we are going to break up the fallow ground. And that's why we have removed all the seminars and all the other things. Because here, we really want to pray. And for those of you who are new in our workers' meeting here, the workers' meeting of the 70s, when we came into the workers' meeting, we could be preaching sometimes till 11.30, till 12 o'clock. You see, those days, we were ready to serve the Lord. That's the consecration that we are. That's what we put in the foundation that made the church so solid and so strong, and that is bringing the people now. It is the prayer of yesteryears that God is answering. And that's why the church is growing. It's not your own prayer, please. Because you people now, you can't pray. Can people pray now? When you have two, three services, immediately we say rise up to pray. They are yawning. They cannot pray. Except when they are praying for promotion and money and healing and children and new wife and new husband and car and being sent overseas and claim whatever you want. That's the only time they pray. But tell them to pray and break up the fallow ground. They'll be yawning. They can't pray. They'll be going to the toilet, going up and down. And then because we are waiting for the second service, we're closing time. And then we say now you can go home. And they are so happy the prayer time has finished. That's church. When we started, it wasn't like that. The people prayed. They prayed. The prayer is still being answered now. If it were not for the prayers at that time, if we were to depend on the prayers that you people are praying, the snapshot prayer, the five minutes prayer, after the messages that you hear today, if that is what we hear, the devil would have cut off our throat before you know what is happening. Oh, it's the prayers of those years. That even though we prayed those prayers in the 70s. Now, let me ask you. The people that you know who have been in this church, you see their lives are different. In fact, some of the messages they had at that time, they can never be the same again. They can, even though they might be, you know, be getting cold, they can never be like you. There are some things that will never come on their mouth, never come on their body, never come in their lives. The consecrations of those years, even though part of them now, they are already changing. But it's difficult for them to totally change. They have been taught the language of Canaan. And it's difficult for them to totally adapt into the language of the Egyptians. But you new people that are coming, I'm sorry for you. That you do not know what it means to go deep with the Lord. And say, Lord, whatever it takes, I will be like Paul the Apostle. Who though he was a highly respected, highly talented man. He said, the things that were gained unto me, I count as done. And he just uploaded everything and he said god what will you have me to do tell me anything you know what he meant he said tell me anything you tell me to die i will die you tell me to go to prison i'll go to prison you tell me to offload anything i would offload it now i've given my life to the lord you know that's christianity friends that's christianity anything less than that is child's play and you see a lot of people that have child's play they just they go to church to pray to play Anything less than total, absolute surrender. Giving your life totally to the Lord, like Paul the Apostle saying, Lord, what will you have me to do? If you are in anything like that, it's not Christianity. You have not started yet. But the one that will go to the altar 
and will say, Now, Lord, we want to mean business with you. It will take more than five minutes prayer. It might take more than 30 minutes prayer. Because the hardened heart is not going to be broken up in one minute. Look at, you know, all that ground that is hardened. You cannot break it up in five minutes. It's going to take some time. But if you are willing, there's a lot awaiting you. And I want to encourage you that this workers retreat, to make up your mind, you'll break up your fallow ground. Now, if you don't do it, you are not even a Christian. That means you are backsliding. And that means you don't want to come back like Peter. Peter backslid, but he broke up his fallow ground. He came back. Judas backslid. He never came back. He committed suicide. If you backslide and you are not willing to break up your fallow ground, if you have not backsliding, but you have been at the heart center of the preaching of the gospel before, but now you are at the edge. A lot of things are blowing into your life, and you are not breaking up your fallow ground. The power and the grace of God will leave you. God is not going to joke with his grace. He's not going to continue putting his grace on people that are going astray, going astray, going, getting cold, getting lukewarm, and he will not break up their fallow ground. He will spill you out of his mouth. But I want to challenge you that this workers' retreat, you make it a time of prayer. Do you know in the 70s, in the early part of uh, you know, this church, whenever we come for workers' retreat like this, I personally, as you know, the leader, I have to be calling on some people, begging them that we have cooked food, they should go and eat because the food will waste. They will pray and pray. Sometimes it's difficult to stop them praying. And they, we're not praying for money, for women, for men, for husbands, for children. It never came into our prayers in workers' meetings. Even in the normal meetings, rarely will it come. We just left that to the Lord for him to add unto us. But what we're concerned about is was heaven. And, uh, but nowadays, you find people that they have eaten two times today, and when we want to pray, they say they are hungry. They are wanting to find out when are we going to eat. No, we didn't come here to eat. If the food finishes, praise the Lord. If the food does not go around, praise the Lord. If God does not allow us to be able to take that meal and it digs up those things in your heart, and you begin to pray until you even forget there is any food any, anywhere, praise the Lord. And if there is no water to drink or no water to take your bath, well, not more, more like the backsliding Israelites, we just praise the Lord for it. And here we have not come to distribute, uh, you know, business cards, or how are you, shaking hands and all that. You know, in those days, we found it difficult to even see anybody's face. We'll be looking on the ground like this. We'll be bowed down with conviction and with body. We'll see a lot of people that are still perishing. When we came to a workers' retreat like this, we touched heaven. In fact, some of us, if God had not restrained us, we would have gone from that workers' retreat to heaven. Our hearts, our minds were so much in heaven. And we add the glory of God upon our lives. And those times when people, when they evangelized, the people they were evangelizing, they couldn't lie. Real conviction and real body will come on those people. You see, it was a time when we really touched the Lord. But you know how we did it? We broke up our fallow ground. That's how we did it. And that's how we're going to do it now. You'll break up your fallow ground. You'll tell the Lord, Lord, I know I'm backsliding. Don't throw it to another person. Don't say, brother, so-and-so are backsliding. Sister, so-and-so are backsliding. You yourself, you are not like you ought to be. Then you sow to yourself in righteousness. You seek the Lord until he comes and he rains righteousness upon you. Let us pray. If you want to kneel, you can kneel. If you want to rise up, you can rise up. But you must not sleep. You must not sleep. Break up your fallow ground. Talk to the Lord in prayer. It will take sincerity before you can make it to heaven. You must be honest. You must be sincere. Break up your fallow ground. Don't let your riches hinder you from the kingdom of God. It can hinder you if you allow it. 
Don't let your education hinder you from the kingdom of God. It will hinder you if you allow it. Don't let your knowledge hinder you from the kingdom of God. It will hinder you if you depend upon it. Don't argue yourself outside the kingdom of God. If you continue that argument, you will be lost. Don't let children, marriage, take your heart away from the Lord. Don't let your stubbornness, hardened heart, take you away from the kingdom of God. Don't joke with your soul. Don't gamble with your life. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. There is judgment awaiting the backslider if you don't repent. All the worldly practice you have brought into the marriage, into family life, into wedding, get rid of it. You are now befriending unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't be wise in your own sight. The wisdom of man is foolishness with God. Seeking the praise of men, that will say you look nice, you look well. If that has become an idol to you, get rid of it. If you don't, you will be lost. Talking is now your full-time business. Talk, 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 and talk. If you don't caution yourself, restrain yourself, you'll be lost. Get rid of those things in your life. Have you become rebellious in the church? The pastor, the preacher cannot talk to you anymore. You know more than everybody. If you don't get rid of that attitude, you will go to hell. Rebellion is not a Christian character. Are there some friends who are hardening your heart? Advising you to be rebellious? If you don't get rid of them and separate yourself from them, they will lead you to hell. In all humility, yield yourself to the Lord and follow after the Lord wholeheartedly. Break up your fallow ground. All the affections for the things of the world, all competition with other churches, they dress like this. Why can't we dress like that? They use this type of thing. Why can't we use it? They travel all around. Why can't we travel too? They call themselves by big names. Reverence, Bishop. Why can't we? All the competition with one another here. Undressing. Sister so and so wore that type of dress. I must wear it also. Don't lose your soul through the pride of life. It's not dressing that makes us to know who is a leader or who is a worker or who is important or not important. It's the spirit of God in the heart of a man, in the heart of a woman. One that shall be greatest among you, let him be your servant. The deceitfulness of riches, 
will close the gate of heaven against you if you don't get rid of it. Set your affections on things above, not on things in the world. Don't allow marriage to drag you to hell. Break up your fallow ground. Sow to yourself in righteousness. Seek the Lord until he rains righteousness upon you. Our Father, we thank you and bless your name. Because you have spoken your word unto us. We have no excuse if we are sincere with ourselves and with your word. We have backslidden. We have gone away from the truth in the sense of your word. Father in heaven, your word is clear. We have condemned worldliness in others, but we have worldliness in ourselves. Our past consecrations have gone away in a very subtle manner, unknown to us. Today, everything looks like a nightmare. But, as we have heard from your word, that it is because you have not forsaken us, that's why you have spoken to us.